What's up guys? Hi and welcome to Uncle Scott's Kitchen. Today we are going to take a look at these guys. This is a five piece set of Moviel French made stainless steel M Cook cookware. You know when I look at cookware online my biggest question is always how does it cook? We're going to answer that today. We're going to do a ton of cooking tests in these things, show you precisely how they perform, we're going to run through their stats and features, and then we're going to do a big high temp sear test of this guy. Say your prayers, buddy. And finally answer the question, is this a good set of cookware for your money? Who knows? Let's get started and find out. You know, I was looking back at these Moviels. I unboxed these things several months ago. And in that video I took when I was unboxing, I was clean shaven. So I have been cooking in these things for roughly one beard now. I like the beard on your face. <laughs> I like the beard on my face. <laughs> Got the peanut gallery in the background. The um, peanut you're the peanut gallery. You are the peanut gallery. Anyway, this is a five-piece set. Um, the uh, the M Cook series. That's kind of their higher end in the stainless steel line. Um, five ply, three internal layers of aluminum. So we should see if we're going to get some good heat distribution when we do some cooking in a little while. Um, induction compatible stainless steel exterior, and then a nice shiny stainless steel interior. Been using these things, like I said, for a few months now. And I've been pretty happy with Moviels. I, I've reviewed this uh, carbon steel, reviewed some of their copper, and I was really looking forward to getting some of this stainless steel to check it out. Um, normally around here I review the bigger frying pans, those 12, 12 and a half inch uh, frying pans. My wife was going to kill me if I got one more big frying pan, so I decided to go with this set. Um, when you buy sets, Remember that lids count as pieces. So I got the uh, not, roughly nine and a half inch saute pan with lid, the 1.9 quart um, saucepan with lid, and this roughly 10 and a quarter inch frying pan. It didn't have a lid, but see the saucepan and the saute pan seem to be the thicker ones. This frying pan, for whatever reason, seems to be just a skosh thinner. Before we do some cooking, let's talk a little bit about money. As I mentioned, this is a set. Um, I paid for this myself, which kind of sucks for the old pocketbook, but it does help to keep my reviews as unbiased as possible. My opinions are my own. Hope you guys appreciate that. I bought this set for $300. Now, if you go to Moviel's website, I went there a couple days ago, they got this set listed for about $6.95 list price. Who pays list? Not me. They had a sale on for about $4.95. That's still pretty expensive. But down around $300, I got this on a Black Friday deal. I thought that was a pretty screaming bargain right there. So the moral of the story here is if the set has pieces that you want and you see a good price, go ahead and jump on it. You don't know how long those deals are going to last. These handles are stainless steel and pretty good size handles, I would say, pretty long. Uh, some people I've read kind of complain about the thinness of the handle in this part. You know, they're pretty thick, top to bottom, but right to left, a little bit thin there. And I think what that is, I've seen this in some fancy videos of French restaurants and French chefs. A lot of times you will see an actual chef grab a pan with a towel. If you do that, that thinness is not a big deal, and actually it feels pretty good. So that may be where some of that thinness comes from. One other mild complaint that I've heard some people talk about is the small size of the loops on the handles. And some people say they can make it tough to grab the handles if you're wearing an oven mitt. Let's see. I don't know. Worked okay for me there. I also want to give a little shout out to Moviel at the top here. When you unbox these things, they come in paper bags, essentially nice paper bags. So you pull the pieces out and they always have this little slip, slip of paper. Each one has a little slip of paper with someone's name on there. And that kind of lets you know that there is a person 
on the other end of these things at the Moviel factories. So I do like that. Okay, so let's jump in and do a little cooking. Gonna start with the saute pan with lid. I'm gonna make a little bit of lemon and asparagus risotto. Risotto. Now for me, risotto was an inspirational food. I spent a couple of years in Italy, ate a ton of delicious risotto, came back to the United States, and suddenly that microwave pack of Uncle Ben's just was not cutting it anymore. I had to learn how to cook it myself. So if you don't have a good risotto game, I think it's a great thing to learn. This much skill and practice yields about this much deliciousness and flavor. So if you're ever at a dinner party, maybe on a date, someplace where you have to do some cooking with other people, be the risotto guy. Be the risotto guy. It sounds really exotic. It's really just fancy rice, but it sounds exotic. It doesn't take a whole lot of skill. It's absolutely delicious. And if you're standing at a stove, you can have a glass of wine in one hand, stir the risotto with the other, and it seems like you're doing something really profound. Be the risotto guy. Okay, so let's take a look at this lemon and asparagus risotto and see if we can level up some weeknight pork chops and maybe throw in a risotto tip or two. Got some oil and butter, olive oil and butter heating up in the Moviel. In goes some chopped onion. And I just want to soften this up, let it sweeten up a little bit. I don't want to brown the onion here. That takes a couple of minutes. You just have to keep an eye on it. In goes my risotto rice. I'm using Arborio here. And what you want to do is get that all coated up and let that toast up just a little bit. Again here, you don't want to see a lot of browning here. You just want to kind of wait until you get a little bit of a hint of toasty aroma coming up, but don't brown the rice. And here's my favorite part. I'm going to add in a cup of white wine. I really do love that sound. That's my favorite part of making risotto. And once that wine has been absorbed, what I'm going to do is ladle in some hot chicken stock. Just a side note here, I am heating up that stock in a Moviel copper pan, which I reviewed a year or two ago. Had really good luck with my other Moviels so far. And what you want to do is occasionally ladle in some of that hot stock and stir that rice, let it absorb, let it simmer and absorb that stock. And when it starts to look a little dry, you ladle in a little bit more. Now, while that is simmering, let's talk just a moment about risotto timing. Uh, risotto, you want to serve it al dente with a little bit of to the tooth, a little bit of chew to it. You don't want it crunchy, but you certainly don't want it mushy. And for that reason, you need to time your risotto as best as you can with when you want to serve your meal. There is a window in which risotto is nice. And after that window, it's going to continue to absorb liquid and soften and expand and get a little bit mushier. So you got five, 10 minutes window there, but you don't want to make risotto a half hour ahead of your meal. So time it as best you can. Now, without being too exact, my risotto typically takes around 20 minutes. Somewhere around minute number 12, there is a decision point and you have to decide, are you a crunchy vegetable person or are you a soft vegetable person? I'm a little bit more of a soft vegetable person these days. So somewhere around minute number 12, I go ahead and add my asparagus so that it can simmer and soften up just a little bit. If you prefer crunchier asparagus or crunchier vegetables, wait a few minutes more. Wait till 16, 17 minutes and then add your asparagus. Now for my asparagus, this may be a little bit wasteful, but I only use the top half of the asparagus. I know some people will snap the stalks farther down the stalk. Some people will take a vegetable peeler and peel that bottom part of the stalk to get a little bit more uh, yield out of their asparagus, I guess you could say. I really just, I hate to say it, I don't care about that. I just use the top half of the asparagus, cut that into inch, inch and a half inch pieces. And like I said, for me, I like to go ahead and get that asparagus in there, let it simmer and cook and soften up just a little bit, maybe more so than some other people like to do. Around minute number 18, you need to start checking your risotto. Check it for texture, also for salt. Now, if you use salted butter, and you use salted stock, you're probably not going to need to add any salt, but definitely check it. And then I'm going to add a tablespoon or so of lemon zest. And then I'm gonna finish the risotto with butter, Parmesan cheese, and a little bit of heavy cream. 
And that's one more reason to be the risotto guy. Any dish you finish with butter, Parmesan cheese, and heavy cream is going to be absolutely delicious. Your friends are going to love it. And back on the Moviel throughout, I got nice, even heating. I think that aluminum core spread that heat, that gas flame really well. Got nice bubbling and sizzling edge to edge throughout the process. I think it did a great job and this lemon and asparagus risotto really leveled up these weeknight pork chops. Now let's take a look at a little weeknight chili also in the saute pan here. And what I wanna show is just browning some meat here in the saute pan. Normally I would brown meat in a frying pan here because I'm gonna kind of make a one pot meal. I just wanna show browning meat in here. I actually did a pretty good job. I got the meat broken up here, um, non-stick at first. I can drag the spatula through, nothing sticking. As that moisture and water evaporates out of the hamburger, it starts to brown a little bit more. Get a few sticky bits on the bottom of the pan. And I've also cut up an onion, got that in there with the beef. I've got a spice blend that I mixed up with some chili powder, garlic powder, some cumin, some red pepper, and a little bit of beef stock. Now normally when I would make weeknight chili, I would use one pound of meat, one can of beans, and one can of tomatoes. Here, because everything's so expensive these days, I'm actually kind of extending, to use the term, extending the chili, extending the beef just a little bit. I'm using two cans of beans, two cans of tomatoes, and just one pound of beef. And I like when I add those tomatoes, that acidity and that moisture kind of deglazes those sticky bits off the bottom of the pan. Then I'm going to let everything simmer for 15, 20 minutes or so. And here I want to talk about finding the correct burner that your pan likes on your stovetop. When I was browning the meat, I had the pan on a bigger burner. And then when I got the, the wet ingredients in there and started to simmer, I had it on a smaller burner. It seemed to be bubbling just in the middle. And I found that the medium sized burner was just right. That is where this Moviel likes to live on my stovetop. And on that burner, the flame spreads out nicely and I get nice, even heating edge to edge. So definitely when a pan is new, make sure you find the burner where it likes to live. And with a few crackers, sour cream and cheddar cheese, the Moviel produced another good weeknight meal. Summer Symphony Veggies. I made that up. Summer Symphony Veggies. I thought that sounded pretty nice. But what I'm going to do here is cook up some carrots yellow squash, green zucchini, and some onions, along with some butter, sugar, and spices. And what I want to show you here with the Moviel is a nice way to use the lid. Now, there's a little bit of a decision point up front here, and it may go without saying, but the size you chop your veggies is going to determine how long they need to cook to get them done the way you like them. I like mine relatively soft, so I'm going to use somewhat smaller pieces of veggie here. Also for the zucchini and the squash, I am going to cut those so that I can remove the internal seeds. Those tend to get a little bit mushy when cooked and I want more of the more crunchier, firmer outer texture of the vegetable without the mushy seeds in the middle. So remove those. Get everything chopped up and what I'm gonna do here is get the Moviel on the burner. I've got some water and some butter in there. I'm also going to add a teaspoon of sugar and here I want to use the lid to do a little bit of a steaming and glazing technique. And I'm going to get the carrots in first. They typically take a little bit longer to cook than the other veggies. So get those going first. Then I get the onion, the squash, and the zucchini in there. Salt and pepper, of course. And then at least a teaspoon, since we're cooking in French cookware here, of Herbe de Provence. la ti da And then cover it and let those veggies kind of steam and boil and cook in there for usually takes about eight to 10 minutes or so. Now over that 10 minutes of cooking, a lot of that water that's in the pan is going to evaporate away. After you remove the lid, there's gonna be a little bit of moisture remaining in the pan. There's also the butter and the oil. Those are still gonna be in there. You can add a little bit more if you need to. You'll hear the veggies start to sizzle and with the butter and the oil and the moisture and the herb de Provence and the sugar in there, cook them another couple of minutes, those veggies will develop a delicious, slightly sweet, savory glaze. Absolutely delicious summer symphony veggie. Now let's take a look at the little 1.9 quart saucepan. Now it's tough to go completely crazy over a small saucepan, but I do want to show that it's good for basic 
heating task here, heating up some homemade Ribolita, get nice even bubbling and heating there. Using the lid, I'm gonna make one of nature's most perfect foods, cheese grits. We did have cheese grits for breakfast. They were delicious. And not only are cheese grits delicious on their own, thinking back to my childhood in Alabama, I had many a breakfast of cheese grits served on top of cheese toast. One of my favorite breakfasts, and I'm pretty sure that's low carb. Uh, now let's do a little fancier cooking and make a Mornay sauce, which is actually too fancy for Uncle Scott's Kitchen. Let's just call it a white sauce or a cheese sauce. Hey man. Hello. One of the peanuts from the peanut gallery. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go play, man. Yeah, peanut gallery. Yeah. So I got, got three tablespoons of butter. Get that melted and crackling a little in there. In goes three tablespoons of flour. I'm also going to add a pinch of dried thyme. Half teaspoon or so of salt. I like things a little bit salty. You may not want to add that much. And I'm gonna use a lot of pepper here. I like pepper, I like my things, I like my foods a little bit spicy. So I'm gonna use a quarter teaspoon of black pepper, quarter teaspoon of white pepper, and a quarter teaspoon of red pepper flakes or cayenne pepper. I do like to know that it's there. After a minute and a half or so of cooking, I'm gonna add two cups of cold milk, stir really well, make sure there's no lumps in there. Stir that until it boils. And what I want to show with the saucepan here is that if you stir and pay attention, there is no sticking. So I'm not getting any scorching, getting nice even heating with this Moviel 1.9 quart saucepan. Previously, I grated up eight ounces of Gruyere and three ounces of Parmesan cheeses. Got those mixed up, reserved a little bit of those, but added the bulk of those to the white bechamel sauce here and stirred. And we've got ourselves a Mornay. Again, too fancy. Let's just call it a cheese sauce. And I'm going to ladle this over some broccoli and cauliflower in my gratin dish. Spread a little more of that cheese on top, a few buttered breadcrumbs. And after 45 minutes or so in a hot oven, here it is. And I think the Moviel really did help produce a delicious cheese sauce for this broccoli and cauliflower gratin. Now let's take a look at the 10.2 inch frying pan. And here I want to start out with eggs. Eggs in stainless steel, have we lost our minds? No, we have not. Yes! <laughs> uh, gonna start out simply with some scramble. Now I found that eggs in stainless steel, they work just fine as long as you take a few tries to practice and make sure you heat your pan correctly and use enough butter. So I'm heating the pan here on the old gas stove. I have scrambled a couple of eggs. I got some salt and pepper in there. A lot of butter in the pan. In go the eggs. And notice that we're not getting any sticking. Nice scrambled eggs. Now let's try a Western omelet. Similar process here. Got my butter heating up. In go a couple of eggs that I had scrambled up. Let those set up just a little bit. Add my fillings. And I like a little browning on my Western omelets, so I'm getting a little nice browning. I like that nice brown butter flavor on a Western omelet. Fold that thing over. A nice Western omelet. Now this is a French made pan. Let's get a little crazy and try a French omelet in stainless steel. Oh Lord. I'm gonna get my butter heating up. Got my eggs in, shaking, moving back and forth. I actually got this thing to roll up, got it plated. Now, I'm not quite sure this one is ready to present to Julia Child. It's kind of like me in college. Poor, but passing maybe. Give myself a C, C minus on this. I need to work on getting my curds a little bit creamier. However, I did get it out of the pan, got it folded up nicely, and rolled over, and we didn't get any sticking on our French omelet. Let's see if we can redeem ourselves a little bit here with a fried egg. The old fried egg test. Can we slide an egg in stainless steel. Let's see. Got the pan heated up. In goes my butter. In goes my egg. And boom, nailed a fried egg, a nonstick fried egg in a stainless steel skillet. Yeah. Now they're not nonstick skillets. You've got to cook your eggs at the right temperature. You've got to use enough butter. But just getting a nonstick sliding egg in stainless steel, 
I really do like this interior cooking surface on these Moviels. Here, let's take a look at the capacity of this 10 and a quarter inch frying pan. Got a couple of pieces of nice salmon here. This size is a good size for one or two servings of protein. So if I'm cooking for my wife on a weeknight, it's not Sunday dinner, we don't have a lot of people coming over. This is a good size pan for one to two portions. Got these two nice pieces of salmon browning in there with some lemon, some butter, some garlic, some cracked pepper, and those turned out absolutely delicious. And for the grand finale cooking test, we're going to do a high temp sear of this delicious looking ribeye steak. Also going to bring in the saute pan to do a side dish to go along with this steak. I'm going to do some fondant potatoes. Now, I originally saw this method for the fondant potatoes from Jacques Pepin, a video he did. I've sub subsequently seen lots of other people do it this way. But what I'm going to do here is get some water going in the saute pan. I ended up using about three quarters of a cup of water. Got some baby Yukon Golds, got those washed and cleaned up. In they go, in goes a little bit of oil and some butter and obviously salt and pepper. And after about 14 minutes or so, these are tender. I poke them with a knife, they are tender. I'm gonna remove the lid. Now most of the water has evaporated at this point. There's still some remaining butter and oil in the pan. I'm going to gently crack these potatoes, add a little bit more butter and oil, and I'll fry and brown these up just a little bit on both sides. And I'm serving these with some sour cream and a little green onion. Absolutely fantastic, delicious potatoes, a great side dish for a nice, big, thick, juicy steak. So for my steak, I added some salt, some fresh cracked pepper, uh, got a little oil on both sides of that thing, got a little oil in the pan, got the pan really screaming hot here, added in my steak, pretty nice sizzle. I gave the steak about two minutes on each side, then finished that thing up in the oven so the pan can go from stovetop to oven. Now, if I were going to make one complaint or one small nitpick here, it's that this 10.2 inch pan is a skosh thinner than the saute pan. I think maybe when it comes to high temp sears, it would benefit from a little more thermal mass. Um, I typically don't do high temp sears in stainless steel to begin with. If I'm gonna cook a steak, I'm gonna use cast iron or carbon steel typically, unless I am reviewing a frying pan. So I didn't buy this pan to do high temp sears. That being said though, if you're gonna use it for a high temp sear, just know that it's gonna have a little more trouble maintaining a sear than maybe a carbon steel or cast iron. That being said though, the steak still turned out absolutely delicious. Served it with a green salad with some homemade vinaigrette, some tomatoes, a glass of red wine, and of course those fondant potatoes. Absolutely delicious. So if there is a minor drawback with this set of Moviels, it's that maybe you might not want to use that frying pan for a high temp sear of a steak. You might want to go carbon steel or cast iron. But really, I didn't buy these Moviels to sear steaks. I bought them for other cooking tasks. I like the pan frying of that salmon. Uh, it does a good job with eggs. I like the saute pan for the veggies, the chili, the fondant potatoes, and then of course the bechamel grits and what have you with the 1.9 quart saucepan. So in my lineup, these are my go-to pans in their respective sizes. I really do like that. And I mentioned at the top of the review, I got this set for about $300 even. 300 bucks for five Moviels, roughly 60 bucks a piece for these M Cooks. I think that is a screaming deal. If you find them in that price range, they definitely get a thumbs up. Up around $700 or so, that might be top of the mark. I think that's pushing things just a little bit. Don't know if I'd go 700 on this set, but if you get a good deal on these things, I think they're great looking pans. We've seen that they produce delicious food and I really like them. They get a thumbs up. Now, if you've enjoyed this review and found it helpful, make sure you subscribe to the old channel. Turn on your notifications so that you're notified when new videos are released. Look somewhere on this screen for links to other videos you might enjoy. Check out the shopping links if you want to get some of these for yourself. Thank you for watching. We'll see you again next time on Uncle Scott's Kitchen.